number 162 God be the glory 162 prayer. Father, we thank you this morning for your blessings. We thank you, uh, Lord, for your goodness and your mercies and your grace towards us. And Father, we just pray this morning as uh, uh, we reflect back, Lord, on the uh, on Hurricane Harvey and, Lord, the uh, destruction and all that uh, is involved with that. We just continue to pray for the families as they uh, recover and recoup from uh, all of uh, uh, the problems, Lord, that are associated with that and help, Lord, with the uh, adjustments, Lord, of homes and uh, all the, the, 
the necessary uh, paperwork and all that needs to be done. We just pray, Lord, for each and every one. And Heavenly Father, we pray for uh, Florida this morning and uh, the affected areas of, uh, of Hurricane Irma. We just pray, Father, that you would continue, uh, Lord, to be uh, watchful over your people. Uh, pray for uh, for the Stancil this morning and uh, his church, Lord, that uh, you would uh, uh, be with them, help them, Lord, encourage them. I know there's another a number of pastors uh, that that know us and we know them, uh, Lord, that are in the path of the storm. So we just pray, uh, Father, that your hand would be upon uh, upon them and help the families, Lord, of uh, uh, of those churches. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray again that you'd bless the service today. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Good morning and welcome to the Sunday morning services of Northern Road Baptist Church. If you would, if I could draw your attention to Psalm 19, verses 1 through 3. It's real short, and uh, I know y'all will, will already be familiar with this. It just really jumped out at me as I read it this morning. It says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. When Solomon's writing this, or David, what he's saying is, is um, that um, all creation, be it the heavens, be it the earth, it points like a laser to the creator God. It's just something that you can't get away from. For you to deny that there's a creator God, you have to hold to the opinion that something in itself has the power to create itself. And that just is just a non sequitur. You can't get that from and I was looking at my Bible here. You know, it's got a uh, cover, it's got pages, it's got information written on it. Clearly, you look at this, and what does it say? Somebody created it, clearly. And using the same deduction, using the same logic, the heavens and the earth scream there is a creator God. And for anyone to deny or to state otherwise just simply doesn't make good sense. But anyway, the pastor's going to have a whole lot more to say about this creator God a little bit later and how to have a relationship with him. And so without stealing, stealing his thunder any further than that, uh, let's go ahead and look at our announcements for today. Okay, as always, uh, Sunday school begins at 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings. Our worship services are at 11 a.m. Our evening services are at 5 p.m. on Sundays. And then Wednesday evening services are at 7 p.m. We always provide a nursery for those under the age of four. Wednesday night services are very special at Garth Road Baptist Church. They're family night. So we invite you to bring your kids, bring bring other people's kids too, <laughs> if you would. Um, we have uh, some in-depth Bible study for the adults, but then we always have really good programs for the, the, the children and the youth as well. And it's just a whole lot of fun, and, and we'll, we'll promise we'll get you out of here as early as we can. Uh, Grandparents Day. Today is Grandparents Day. If you're a grandparent, can you raise your hand? A lot of grandparents in here today. Right? Just grandparents are wonderful people. You know, they, they get to spoil them and send them home, which is the best part of it. But thank you for being a blessing, blessing to your family. Uh, for those on the East Coast, let's go ahead and please remember to pray for Hurricane Irma. For everyone that's still recovering from the hurricane that we suffered here, Hurricane Harvey, let's continue to remember them in prayer as well. Because um, responding to it is one thing, recovering from it is a whole different story. It takes a lot of time, a lot of money, and a lot of effort. Okay, what's coming up? November the 23rd is Thanksgiving today. September, and then December the 25th is Christmas Day. And again, thank you for being here today. If you're a visitor with us here today, if you'll reach over in front of the, uh, the, the, the seat in front of you, you're going to find a little green visitor card. If y'all wouldn't mind filling that out and putting it in the offering plate as it comes by, we would appreciate that. We'd love to have a record of the visit. And don't be surprised. We're, we're a real friendly bunch. And uh, don't be surprised if people come up, shake your hand, and say hello. Um, again, thank you for being here today. I know everyone's going to get a wonderful blessing from the service. Turn to page number 237. Page number 237. Let's all stand. We'll ask some men come forward to see the offering on the last course, the cleansing way. 237. <laughs> The fountain deep and wide 
Jesus, us, my Lord, mighty to save, to his wounded side. The cleansing stream I see, I see, I plunge and all it cleanseth me. Oh, praise the Lord, it cleanseth me, it cleanseth me, yes, cleanseth me. I see the new creation rise, I hear the speaking blood, it speaks polluted, nature dies, sinks neath the cleansing flood. The cleansing stream I see, I see, I plunge in all, it cleanseth me, oh praise the Lord, it cleanseth me, it cleanseth me. Has cleansed me. Amazing grace is left below to feel the blood applied. And Jesus only, Jesus know, my Jesus crucified. Cleansing stream I see, I see, and oh, it cleanseth me. Oh, praise the Lord. Cleanseth me, it cleanseth me, yes, cleanseth me. Amen. As we receive the offering this morning, just continue to pray. Uh, finances of the church are very important. Uh, we cannot do ministry unless we have the financial uh, backing from the uh, from God's people. Uh, God told us what to do, and we should just obey what God told us to do. Uh, so we receive the offering reminding you the scripture teaches us that God loves a cheerful giver as we bow for prayer for the uh, Philippi Lisa and prayer please. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for gathering us here today. I want to thank you for the offering that we're about to take up. Please bless it to uh, your service, Lord. I want to ask uh, your Holy Ghost to fill Pastor Jim as he gives us the service today. Let us take it out and apply it to our lives, Lord. Thank you for all these things. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
I will tell you, there's a lot of truth in this song. <laughs> Many years you search and search and search and search and you can't find the answers and you don't have the, have the peace and comfort and strength and all of a sudden you find the Lord and right there. <laughs> it is. And, uh, you know, I hesitate to say this, but, you know, when everybody else was stressing over Hurricane Harvey, uh, I laid my head down on my pillow and went to sleep. And uh, <laughs> I slept through it, and uh, you know, which is probably not a wise thing since I live in a mobile home. Uh, but uh, I just laid down and went to sleep. I said, you know, it is what it is. And I got up the next morning. I looked out my front door as I was letting my dogs go uh, do their morning business. And um, I'm looking out the detention pond. There's a lot of water in the detention pond, but I mean, it looked like it just had a heavy rain. I'm thinking, well, it wasn't as bad as we thought it was going to be <laughs> until Miss Ruth called me. <laughs> and then we found out how really bad it was out there outside of my w little world here uh, so as long as I'm in my little world everything's fine when I get out into everybody else's world you cause me problems that's all I can say uh, so anyway if you will take your Bible turn to the book of Genesis uh, the book of Genesis chapter number 25 chapter number 25 uh, rather than having you stand and follow along as I read, because I'm going to read quite a bit this morning, uh, because I want to lay a foundation uh, for the message. I'm going to speak to you this morning on the subject, Seeking a Bride. Seeking a Bride. Now, uh, there are probably a few in our, in our midst that are seeking a bride, okay? Uh, some have sought <laughs> and are in the process I was sitting a little too close over there. I was just, just <laughs> and they moved to the other side just so I couldn't see them, thinking maybe you know that, that right eye is not a, as good as that left eye is. Uh, but the truth is, the right eye is better than the left eye. So I got it on you. All right. Anyway, uh, the truth is, is that many times when we go and seek a bride and or a husband, uh, we have certain things, certain ideas. <laughs> uh, one of the um, owners of the Gap, which is the management group that, that uh, uh, owns the Hilton Garden Inn and, and several other properties, uh, he and I were talking, he's a Christian from Louisiana, and uh, he and I were talking, and he said this guy came to him the other day, oh, it's been a few months ago, and he said, well, he said, uh, he said, man, he said, I have been praying and praying and praying for a wife. And so Trent says, well, he said, uh, what, you know, how have you been praying? And he starts going on and, you know, telling him about how, you know, everything he wanted in this woman. And he said, well, just put it all, sum it all up. He said, uh, I, I'm, I'm looking for a perfect 10. And uh, Trent said he looked at the guy and he called his name. And he said, um, do you think God is going to give a 6, a perfect 10? <laughs> now, that wasn't very nice. But, you know, we, we have these expectations, do we not? I mean, we, we, you know, we want the, we, you know, as a, as a man, we want the most uh, uh, beautiful, voluptuous, uh, uh, figured, uh, you know, uh, young lady to, to, to marry, you know. We, 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 we look at exteriors, okay? <laughs> I'll stop it. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Deborah. Get on to them. <laughs> All right. Uh, you, you, you start looking, I mean, at, in, in, our, in our human mind, we start looking at the material. We start looking on the outward appearance. But the outward appearance is not what we should be looking at. You know, my wife, when, when, when we married, uh, she told me that the reason she married me is because she loved my hands. I don't know what about my hands. But anyway, she's... she's <laughs> Uh, and all joking aside, that's what she said. But she said, no, she said, uh, really, she said, I liked what you carried in your hands. She said, every time I saw you, you had your Bible with you. And every time I saw you, you were, you were, were living a godly life. Every time I saw you, I noticed things about you. Now, she wasn't looking exteriorly because really uh, you know I'm a four when this other guy's a six I mean brother all right so uh, no amens right there brother Jason okay so anyway I mean 
what is it that we look for in, in a wife? Well, I tell the, the young people, and those of you who are still here and young people and have yet to uh, find that perfect person, when I got saved at 16, I began to pray that God would provide me a godly wife. I didn't pray for looks. I didn't pray for all of the materialistic things. What I prayed for is that God would give me a perfect wife. And in all of that, you know, of course, I did pray that she could sing because I love to hear people sing, you know, and have a beautiful voice. And I, and I really wanted a wife that could play the piano since God had called me to preach. And, you know, it's likely I'm going to need a pianist, right? Because uh, if you have your wife and she's a pianist, you are never without a pianist, right? And so, unless she's mad at you, uh, you know, but yeah, that never happened uh, that I recall. But anyway, so I began, I began to outline to God what it was that I wanted, okay? And God provided for me, and God provided for her uh, a mate that we could come together. Now, was everything perfect? Uh, I wish it were. I was telling Nan and Miss Beth the other day in the office, I said, I had an awesome dream last night. And I said, Karen and I were together. We were sitting. We were holding hands. And that's what I like to remember. Okay? That was the way that we were on a daily basis because I married my best friend. You know, and so when you stop and you consider a mate and you're talking, thinking about you know, who you're going to marry or who you have married because there are a few probably that have made mistakes and you never want to make a mistake in the area of marriage okay because your life will be miserable all the way around both him and her and so you need to be careful about that but in this situation Isaac really didn't have any say so this was an arranged marriage okay Here's, here's Isaac, and Isaac is at home. He's just lost his mother. If you read chapter 24, we find that Sarah died, and she's been married in the plain of uh, Machpelah, and, uh, and so she's been buried there. And so now then Abraham comes to his servant and says, I want you to go to the land of my nativity. I want you to go to where I was born, to my people, to my kindred, and I want you to find a wife for my son Isaac. Okay, so let's, let's read this, this portion here of Scripture. Genesis chapter number 25, and we'll begin reading in verse number 1. It says, Then again Abraham, uh, Abraham took... Am I in the right place? Ishmael. No, that's supposed to be in 24. That's why my page turned. Okay. Can't blame that on anybody but me. All right, look at chapter 24, and we'll, we'll go from there. And Abraham was old and well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and I will make thee swear by the Lord God of heaven and the God of, of the earth that, those, uh, that thou shalt not take a wife, unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. But thou shalt go unto my country and to my kindred and to take a wife unto my son Isaac. A second here, my contact just <laughs> rolled out of the way. Uh, and the servant said unto him, per, uh, per adventure the woman will not be willing to follow me unto this land. Must I needs bring thy son again unto the land uh, from whence thou camest. And Abraham said unto him, Beware that, uh, thou, that thou bring not my son thither again. The Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, which spake unto me and that uh, swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land he shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence. And if the woman will not be willing to follow thee, then thou shalt be clear from this my oath 
Only bring not my son again, uh, uh, thither again. And the servant uh, put out his hand, un, or put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swear to him concerning that matter. Uh, let's leave off reading right there for just a moment, and let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Our dearly fathers, we bow before you this morning. Uh, we ask, Father, that you'd help us to uh, visualize in our mind's eye, uh, Lord, the situation that we are uh, experiencing here in uh, the book of Genesis, chapter number 24. And Lord, let's uh, help us not only to see uh, what Abraham's uh, intent was for his son, but Lord, help us to see the intent, uh, Lord, that you have for your children uh, in this beautiful story uh, that we read today. Dear Heavenly Father, speak to hearts, encourage, strengthen, for it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. As we, <coughs> excuse me, look here, we see... We see a couple of things in, in these first few verses uh, about Abraham. First of all, Abraham uh, has come to his eldest servant, and he said, now I want, I've got a job for you to do. I've got a job for you to do. Now, if you remember uh, when um, Abraham was talking to God, and he said, you know, here, I don't, I don't you know, you're saying I'm going to be a big nation, uh, a mighty nation, but I don't have any progeny. I don't have any children. And because I don't have any children, all I have here is this, uh, this servant of mine. He's like a child to me. He's like a son to me. I, I, am I going to raise up seed through him? And God said, oh, no, 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 no. We, you know, and I'll appoint to Sarah the time again, and you'll have a son out of your own loins. Now, this servant has been commissioned by God or by Abraham uh, to go and find a wife for his son. Now, stop and think about these particulars for just a moment. Okay, here we have a, a servant. Now, this servant probably was raised with uh, Isaac. He probably knows what Isaac likes. He probably has seen Isaac in several situations uh, to know what, he's what he might be looking for. But that is not the point that the servant is making uh, in this story. He's not looking uh, for a wife that uh, Isaac might would like, as I said earlier, from a visual point of view. A visual point of view. Most people make that mistake because the eyesight will get you in trouble every time. Remember Eve? <laughs> when she did what? She saw that the fruit was good and desired to make one wise. What did she do? She ate the fruit. Okay, when we rely on visual uh, stimulus in order to make a decision for our lives, normally we make a mistake. Let me bring it to you in a personal way. When I go into a restaurant and I sit down, what is the very first thing that I look at? What is the very first thing you look at? Okay, <laughs> the dessert menu. Okay, why? And, and, and it's interesting to, to note that What's on that dessert menu and that beautiful picture is not what you get. But they have stimulated your eyes. Say, Man, I want that mold, uh, molten lava cake. Okay, I want that apple fritter. I want that, you know, I want, in fact, I want it all. Okay, it, it's a stimulus to the eye. Now, I know that I don't need that. When you go to the grocery store, what is the one thing at the grocery uh, aisle that you that you encounter when you go there, it's candy bars, and all of my all of them are my favorites. I mean, I'll eat a Snickers bar, I'll eat a you know Three Musketeers, you know I'll eat a, I prefer a Milky Way, I'll eat Payday, I'll eat you know Seven Grand or whatever they are. I mean, the candies that are there, man, I, I'll eat any of them unless it's got coconut in it. But pretty much I'll eat anything. Okay, why do they put it there? It's to shoot up the sales. Why? Because it's a visual stimulus. It's a visual stimulus. Why? They want you to purchase more. Have you ever gone into the grocery store, for those of you that shop, mostly your ladies, uh, some of your husbands or, or men go in, have you ever wondered why you go into the grocery store and then they just apple crate turnover and everything's from this side of the store to the other side of the store? What used to be on this row is now somewhere, somewhere else. You know why they do that? To get you looking. And when you pass by something, they want you to visually see something else 
and you're going to put that in your cart. Okay, because you saw something in that area where you normally bought the uh, pinto beans. Now you see something else. You say, well, I think I'll try that, and you stick it in your basket. Have you noticed that they put all the name brand stuff right in vision and all of the other stuff on the lower shelf? Why? Because they want you to buy the name brand stuff, even though the, the, the Kroger brand is fine. I've only found a couple of things in the Kroger brand I didn't particularly care for. Okay, and so, but they put it there so that you will buy the more expensive and put in your mind that what you're doing is because this is a name brand, because this is Libby's or Green Giant or uh, because it's this, then it has to be better than Kroger. Have you ever come to the realization to understand that, that whatever Green Giant packages here in their package, they're also packaging in Kroger brand? Okay, <laughs> it's the same stuff. Okay, they're just repackaging it, and you get it a little bit cheaper. You know, don't be so, uh, man, I've got to spend it. i got to buy the big stuff because I, I really, you know, that's a visual stimulus. And that's what they are appealing to. It's the same thing if you go into Walmart. When they, what do they put in Walmart for you to see? Things that are going to stimulate your eyes. Why? Because they want you to buy. And how many of you have gone into Walmart thinking, I'm going to buy a gallon of milk, a loaf of bread, and came out spending $200? Hello? <laughs> it's visual stimulus. Okay, now, the servant here is not guided by, fi by physical stimulus, by visual stimulus, because He's not going and looking for the, for the, the, the beauti most beautiful lady there. In fact, he's commissioned to go to a land he doesn't even know. He's, he's going to people he doesn't even know. He doesn't even know the address. Think about it. He doesn't even know what, what, what street they live on. I mean, they didn't have, you know, Google Maps. They didn't have, you know, GPS. They didn't have all those things. And so he goes to this area, and he sits down on a well curb, and, and he, he's sitting there, and he's saying, Now, Lord, <laughs> you're going to have to prosper my way. You're going to have to do it the way that you want to do it because I am totally clueless. Can I submit to you? All of us are totally clueless when it comes to a mate, when it comes to making decisions about expensive things about buying cars, buying houses, buy I mean we we a funeral's a good example. You have a loved one who passes away. Okay, you go to the funeral home, well the funeral home knows that you this is a loved one. Regardless of what you thought of that loved one in your life. And the in the, in the back of your mind you go, man, I'm so glad this person died. Y'all don't think that, do you? <laughs> but honestly, you, you, you look at you, you go, and, and what are they trying to do? They're trying to upsell you. Well, you know your loved one would love this casket. When I get to heaven, I'm going to get in trouble. I'm just telling you. Why? Because I spent more money on the casket for my wife than I, anything else. Why? Because it was green, and that's what I wanted her to have. Okay, now I've told, I always told her, you put me in a hefty bag on the street corner and let the trash cap truck pick me up. Don't go through any expense. But why, at need, we're going to spend more because, why? Because we love them, and we want the best for them, and we want to, you know, and what do we do? You see, that is because they're pushing us that. So here we have a servant, a servant uh, of Abraham, his, his boss, or his, his master, but he looks at it from a standpoint, not of visual stimulus, but what can God do for me? What is God going to do for my master? What is God going to do for my master's son? Because marriage is an important thing. It's not to be entered into lightly, according to the marriage vows. Okay? And so, as we look at that, now he sits down on the well curb, and while he's, while he's praying, this beautiful, voluptuous, uh, a lady, young lady, virgin, comes to the well, and, and he's prayed this. He said, now, Lord, uh, when, you know, 
uh, if you'll prosper my way, if there's a young lady that will come to the well care, he didn't say a beautiful, voluptuous, uh, 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 gorgeous, uh, shapely uh, young lady. He just said, uh, if a young lady, a virgin, comes to the uh, well and, and, and offers to give me something to drink and, fa- and my camels, then I will know that's who it is. That's what they call putting down a fleece. Remember Gideon? You know, he put out the fleece, and it, if it was dry and the wet ground around, you know, don't put out fleeces. Don't do that. I mean, that was something characteristic to what God was working in their lives. But he says, now, now God, this is what I want. There's no other way I'm going to know if this is the right girl or not. And so here comes Rebecca, and she comes to the well curb, and, and she's starting to draw water for her, uh, for her, uh, uh, her cattle. And the servant says, hey, could you give me something to drink? She says, absolutely. Here, let me, here's some, some water for you. Let me go ahead and draw water for your camels. Huh. Very first one that comes right out of the chute. I mean, right there she is. He said, hmm, God's prospered my way. And then he says, she, she, you know, she, he says, well, um, there's a, I'm looking for this guy it, that should live around here. His name is Bethel. Oh, yeah. <laughs> my, <it's> my daddy. <laughs> yeah, I know exactly who he is. He said, well, you think you could have a place for me to bed my camels? And, and all, Oh, absolutely. And he thanks God. He, he prays and he thanks God. Lord, thank you for prospering my way. And he gives her jewelry uh, and, and, and gifts and then goes uh, to her family's house. And as they're sitting down to eat, if you continue to read the story, they sit down and they're talking, and, and they know that he's from Abraham and, and all of these things and, and all. And he sits down and he says, Now, before we eat, I want to tell you what my, my mission is here. I have a mission. I, I, I want you to understand my mission. I want you to understand why that I'm here. I'm not here just to bring tidings of my of my master uh, Abraham and the loss of his wife and and uh, his son and all of these things. I, I'm here for a mission. My my master has sent me here to find a wife uh, of his of his kindred and bring her back to my master's son. Now enters Rebecca. I mean, here, here here's a young lady. She's going. <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> I bet this guy is as homely and toothless as an Arkansas. And, uh, oh, I'm sorry if y'all are from Arkansas. Forgive me. <laughs> yeah, the reason the re- reason they're coming here to find a wife because he's so ugly. Uh, even his mama wouldn't have him, you know, type thing. You know, and so, but she is determined to go with this servant. Why is it that she would, I mean, not knowing Abraham, not knowing his servant, not knowing anything, why would she agree to go to a land she's not familiar with, to people she's not familiar with, and take up a husband that she has never even met? Except that God would put it in her heart. To say this is the right thing to do. I could talk a lot of t- right now about women's intuition. I don't know what it is. I mean, I have no clue. But my wife had a lot of women's intuition, uh, whatever that initiative. What what is that thing I just said? Intuition. Yeah, that's the word I'm looking for. I mean, she would tell you, look, you need to stay away from that. I just don't feel right. I, you know, you need, you need to watch this area. You need to do this. You need, and, and she had a really good woman's intuition. But I think that woman's intuition was more than just reading people's faces and character. I think it's a God-given gift that God gives to women. And husbands, you do well to listen to your wife. Oh, no, I can't listen to her. I'm supposed to be the man, and I'm the head of this house, and I'm the king of this castle, and, and, and she's subservient, and she's my, 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 uh, my, my 
my servant and I'm going to walk all over and, and, and I'm not going to listen to things. She said, you're barking up the wrong tree, buddy. God put you together. She's your helpmate. She's your completer. She's the one that helps you to, uh, to, uh, to formulate an opinion because we do everything logically. We're the fixers. We're the one that wants everything done a certain way. And the wife says, now, honey, you need to be a little kinder to, the, you know, to that little girl. You need to be a little softer because we, we want to be like tell the boys, you know, hey, get up from there. You fell down, skinned your knee, brush it off and go back. The boys don't cry and, and, and we go through all of that. We want those boys to be tough. And then sometimes we want our little girls to be like the little boys. And the wife says, uh, you need to <laughs> kind of pay attention here. You need to look what you're doing. What you're saying, how you're saying. Why? Because that's the softer side of our relationship. I, I get a little nervous when men said, I'm trying to get in touch with my feminine side. Okay. <laughs> Let me move over here. I'm not too sure about your feminine side. Okay. I think we need to be sensitive. But we're men. And men need to be men. You know, young ladies, if you're going to get married to some guy and he won't work, don't marry him. If he won't hold a job before you get married, he will not hold a job after you're married. If he's going to mistreat you before you're married, he's going to mistreat you while you're married. If he's going to pressure you to do things before you're married, believe me, it's going to get worse. Not better. That's why you need to be on God's side. You need to, you know, Rebecca, she, she wasn't a pushover. Oh, right, there's somebody that, that really wants to marry me. I mean, Isaac didn't even know who she was. He'd never seen her. They had not been back there. Relationships are built not on physical attractions. That goes against everything our society teaches now. We've got to try the cow before we buy the milk. You older people will understand that. No. You don't test drive. That's against the word of God. You see, God intends for marriage to be a, a special thing, a special relationship, a special kinship. And when you submit yourself to God and allow God to direct your path. And let me just put a parenthetical statement here. Not everybody's the marrying kind. Not everybody's marrying kind. You go, well, sure I am. I want. <laughs> Young ladies, there's some guys that still hadn't grown up. They're still playing video games. And they're still playing football out in the sandlot. And baseball. And, and you know, they don't know how to, how to do anything because all they're focused on is themselves. If they're focused on themselves now, they're going to be focused on themselves when you get married. Just putting it out there. Now, notice something else here. Let's go to over to verse 50. Then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, the, the thing proceeded from the Lord. We cannot speak unto thee bad or good. Behold, Rebekah is before thee. Take her and go and let her be thy master's son's wife, as the Lord has spoken. And it came to pass that when a Abraham servants heard their words, he worshipped the Lord, bowing himself to the earth, and the servant brought forth jewels of silver and jewels of gold and uh, raiment and gave them to Rebekah, and he gave also to her 
uh, brother and to her mother precious things. Here we have the approval of the family. We have the approval of the family. I know I'm old fashioned, but I think we were taught some things character wise and relationship wise that were wise things to be taught. The young man is to go to the parents and ask permission to take their child. I believe that. You know, you're so old fashioned and you're so narrow minded. That's okay. But I will put it this way. If the family ain't for it, you're going to be miserable. And I've seen a lot of that. Don't get yourself involved in a relationship when the family is again it. I know a couple, they, uh, he lost his mate, she lost her mate, and, and, and they got married, and, and the kids were against it, and the kids would not even attend the wedding service. And that marriage was a miserable marriage because the kids would not come see mama because uh, stepdad was there. and oh, We'll make it work out. <laughs> That's like changing a man after you marry him. If he don't go to church before you marry him, he's probably not going to go after. And if you marry a Catholic and you're a Baptist, I guarantee you, you're not going to raise them in the Baptist church. And probably not even a Catholic church. Because you're never going to go. You need to secure that, that permission. You say, well, that's old-fashioned. It may be old-fashioned, but that will save a lot of misery in the future. The servant did not just go to, uh, to uh, Rebecca's family and say, I'm taking her to my master's son to marry him, and you ain't got nothing to say about it. I mean, and if you read the story, you'll find out that they didn't want to just get rid of Rebecca. Oh, let, let us throw her a party. Let's, have, uh, let, let's stay another 10 days. I mean, they wanted to keep her there. She was, I mean, she wasn't like being kicked out the door. That's my other parenthetical statement here. I, 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 it really angers me when parents say, I just cannot wait till this child turns 18 so I can get them out of my house. I don't like that statement. I don't like the millennial attitude about it nowadays. But back in my day, in my dad's day, when they turned a certain age, they were out of the house. Well, when you got 15 kids, you've got to get rid of some of them. So you can replace them with some others. I mean, but honestly and truthfully, they, they weren't just trying to kick her out and say, hey, you go on, uh, we don't want to see you anymore. Now, all of that in, in relationship to Abraham, the son, the servant, and the bride has a larger application. We know that the servant went to get a bride for his, for his son, for his master's son. We know that. We also know that we have a heavenly father. And the heavenly father sent his son to the earth to seek and to save that which was lost. He died on the old rugged cross. He died and he left this, this, this earth. He ascended up into heaven according to Acts chapter number 1. And they said the same Jesus as you've seen him go will come again in like manner. And you read Revelation chapter 20 and 21 and 22 and you'll find he does come back in like manner. Okay? But what is the purpose of the Holy Spirit? The purpose of the Holy Spirit is to go and get a bride for his master's son. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He works in the hearts and lives and he goes and he, he affects a, the, those who hear the gospel those who respond to the gospel and he brings them as a bride to his master you see, the, you see the correlation here you see the picture here here's Abraham he's the father 
He is in, in likeness as God the Father. We have Isaac, who is the provided son. In fact, chapter number 22, God says, uh, Abraham says that God will provide himself a sacrifice. As God provides himself a sacrifice, God is also going to provide him a bride. Is he not? Who is the bride of Christ? Well, it depends if you're a Baptist bride or not. You say, what's well, a Baptist brighter? A Baptist brighter believes, usually a missionary Baptist messing around. I call them BMAs, Baptist messing around. Okay? They're not missionary in, in any form, but they believe that they are the bride of Christ and nobody else is. That's akin to the Church of Christ who believes that, that if, you, if you're going to go to heaven, you have to be a member and be baptized into the Church of Christ in order to get into heaven. No, the Holy Spirit works on every single person, whosoever will. And he doesn't know who he's going to. He's going out and he, he, he's spreading. As the gospel is being spread, he begins to work in hearts and he begins to pray according to the word of God for a bride for his wife or for his servant's, his servant's uh, his master's son. You get the picture? So now we have here, we have what Abraham has done. He sent his, his, his servant to get a bride for his wife. The servant goes back, gets the bride for his, his wife, uh, for his son, and comes back. And as they're coming back, and, and Rebecca looks and she sees Isaac. She said, who's that guy over there? She said, well, that's my, that's, that's my master's son, Isaac. And here was the first cigarette smoked in the Bible. She lit off her camel. What did she do? She, <laughs> she got off the camel. She didn't light one. She got off of her camel, and she put on her veil... Signifying the fact that she was a virgin. Deserving of the master's son. And they were brought together in marriage. Take your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter number 5. Ephesians chapter number 5. Chapter 5, verse 22 of, of the book of Ephesians. I'm going to start in verse 21 so that we don't get this. Ah, wives have to be in subjection to their husband thing. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Who is he talking about? He's talking about to the church itself, to the elders of the church, to the, to the leaders of the church. Verse 22 says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as, as Christ is head of the church, and is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a, what kind of church? A glorified church. Okay. I lost my place now. Uh, my, a glorified church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as, he, as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it, even as the Lord of the church. For we are the members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave and be joined unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ in the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even 
as himself and the wife see that she reverence her husband. So what is the purpose of this relationship between the husband and wife? It is to show the relationship that God has for his children. Wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. Well, I'm not going to submit to him. You're not given a choice, really. But the husband is to not only submit to Christ, but he's to love his wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. The Bible teaches that we, as the body of Christ, are the bride of Christ. We are the collection of saints that are going to be together that when the rapture takes place and we are raptured out of this place and we go to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Who's going to the marriage supper of the Lamb? Every saved child of God. Did I say every Baptist? No, because not every Baptist is saved. Did I say every church of Christ? Absolutely not. Because not every church of Christ is saved. Did I say every oneness Pentecostal? No. Because not every oneness Pentecostal person is saved. Methodist? No. Episcopalian? Sorry, Brother Roy. No. Catholic? No. Those who have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ are part of the bride of Christ. If you want to know the fact, and if you're going to get upset with me, you can get upset with me on this point, we are not Baptist briders. We do not believe that only Baptists are going to heaven. You'll not find that in the Word of God. Every true believer of and believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is a part of the bride of Christ. So, what relationship does this picture, this pictorial of Abraham the servant, the son, and Rebekah, the wife, have in common with the church today? It's, this, it's a picture. It's a pictorial. It's a, it is a, a, a picture. When you look at that picture, you can see what Christ is going to do for his church in the future. And you and I are part of that future church that, that Abraham was looking for, a city whose builder and maker was God that he believed in, that he trusted in, that he was part of that family. By faith, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So we are part of the body of Christ. We are part of the brand of Christ, just as Abraham was. And Enoch. And all the other Old Testament biblical characters that we read in the Old Testament as we move them forward into, because they were looking towards the cross as we look back. You say, so what, what application does that get me today? That, that says, look, I'm a part of the body of Christ because of what Christ has done on the cross of Calvary and what the Holy Spirit of God has done in my heart to seal me unto the day of redemption. You see, that, that marriage relationship was for eternity. Not eternity in the thing. It was for the life of the marriage. Remember? Until death do us part. That relationship. You say well. <laughs> Brother Lamb I messed that one up. <coughs> We're human we messed up. But that doesn't. When we mess up in God's family. It doesn't kick us out of the family of God. We get closer to God. Because we know. That we need him more today than we did yesterday. So if you're a part of the family of Christ, then you have that picture, that pictorial in your brain of what it is that Abraham did by sending his servant to find a wife for his son. The same way that God, when, when, when Jesus died, before he died, he said, now I'm going to go, I'm going to be offered, and I'm going to send another comforter, one like myself, who will be in you, and he will guide you into all truth. And he will bring you comfort, and he will bring you peace, and he will bring you contentment. He will guide you in all truth. He will be a teacher. 
That is what we receive as a child of God. We receive the Holy Spirit of God who indwells us and helps us to be victorious in our Christian life. That is the benefit of being a part of the bride of Christ. If you are unsaved, then you do not have that benefit. You have to have the benefit of salvation. Just like, I, I know in our society it's okay to live together, but not, in the, not in, within the church. You say, well, that's narrow-minded. No, that's biblical-minded. It's, it's the way God intended. When he brought Adam and Eve together, they, he said, this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. What joined, God had joined together, let not man put asunder. Some can't go back and undo that. But as a part of a child, the child of God, you are not going to be undone from the family of God. God does not write you a bill of divorcement. God does not kick you out of the family simply because you messed up. Supposing that Jason was my son. I consider him a son. But here's Jason. I, I consider him my son. I say he's now biologically mine. He's, he, he's bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. And he goes out and robs a bank and kills five people. He and Lauren are together, the, the new Bonnie and Clyde. <laughs> now we have Bonnie and Clyde out here again. They're going out and robbing banks, killing people and all this. But he's my son. Do I have a right to disown him? I can. I can say, I, I don't approve of your lifestyle. I don't approve of what you're doing. But biologically, by blood, he's always going to be my son. Nothing is going to change that. And by the blood of Christ, you are birthed into the family of God. You're biologically his. And he's not going to biologically disown you because it's an impossibility. Does that mean, well, oh, preacher, you're a Baptist and you believe that, that just, that, you know, that, that no matter what you do, no matter how much sin you did, that, that, you're, that everybody's going to heaven simply because they, they said, I trust Jesus. Well, I got news for you. If you continue to live in sin and the Holy Spirit of God's not convicting you, and you're getting by with it, God doesn't, doesn't whip his chil the children that aren't his. I mean, back when I was a kid, the neighbor whipped me just as much as my mama did. Nowadays, you better not try that. Even with permission. <laughs> but God doesn't spank children that aren't his. So if there's no, no uh, chastisement for, for your wickedness and for your sin and your lifestyle and the way that you're living, something is wrong. Read the book of Hebrews chapter number 12. If you be without chastisement, then you are Ill illegitimate and not a child. So you need to make that right. Because I guarantee you, when I became a child of God, I lived in sin before, but every time I sin now and the Holy Spirit of God convicts me, I know <laughs> closer that I'm a child of God. That I'm an heir of God and I'm a joint heir with Lord Jesus Christ. I might get by with sin for a season. But not forever. And so we must understand. What God is doing for us. Is he's collecting a bride. He's collecting children. To be a part of his family. We're coming in the last days. Someone just posted uh, a, a post about the eclipse and about Hurricane I, uh, Ike, Ike, not Ike, Harvey, being the, you know, the worst hurricane that we've had you know, in comparison to others. In the way of flooding and that, we've got all of the, the wildfires that are going on in Florida and the uh, Washington State and 
all, all over there. We've got Hurricane Irma coming here. And now they're saying that uh, Jose, rather than just going out there and going off into oblivion, is not going to make a circle and come back. Kind of reminds me of going back to 2005 when all those hurricanes kept inundating the United States. Folks, we're living in the last days. And I'm not a prophet of doom, but I'm, I am a prophet to say we need to be ready. We need to help other people get ready for the appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May we stand for prayer. Father, we thank you this morning for your blessings. We thank you for the truth of the Word of God. And Lord, I pray this morning that you'd help us, Lord, to realize that the, Bi the Bible is not just a, a, a collection of words, a collection of stories, a collection of, of, of stories without a connected meaning. As Brother Gary brought out in the 119th Psalm, the heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament showeth forth his handiwork. Lord, we go down and further into that psalm and we find that the word of God is sweeter than honey in the honeycomb. That it's preserved and it's, it's forever. Lord, you've given, us your, you've given us your word so that we would know you and the power of your mind. Lord, speak to our hearts this morning. Lord, if we are a child of God, if we are saved and we, we claim Christ, Lord, we ought to be living for you, serving you, honoring you you with every fabric of our life. Lord, and there's those, those here this morning who do not know you as Lord and Savior. Maybe they're wearing a mask. Maybe they're not making a decision because they're, they're um, afraid of what people will think. Those are all tools of Satan to hinder, Lord, the uh, folks from coming to a saving knowledge of Christ. Lord, I pray that you would uh, remove this morning every barrier in the heart. Lord, that you would bind Satan this morning, not allow him uh, this morning to hinder, uh, Lord, the working of the Holy Spirit in the hearts and the lives as the Holy Spirit is here collecting a bride for himself. Bless the invitation in Jesus' name with our heads bowed and